Let's get started on our last session of the main conference. I would like to introduce Owen Campbell. Uh, Owen is, I am told, a freelancer. He has a family to feed, and his daily rates are extremely reasonable. Uh, I don't know what I'm supposed to take from that, but uh, he's going to talk about uh, ancient Greek philosophy, which I assume will be extremely relevant in a way I haven't fully understood yet. Uh, let's all welcome Owen. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, thank you for coming to uh, listen to a talk at a Python conference on ancient Greek philosophy. Uh, I'm going to take us on a whistle-stop tour in 20 minutes of 2,000, more than 2,000 years' work uh, in one particular thread of philosophy, and one immediate question comes to mind, I suppose. Well, two, really. Why on earth would I want to stand on this stage and do that? And what makes me think you might be interested in listening to me? Well, the answer to that really is because I think we are on the verge of an, of an enormous opportunity. For the first time in human history, we now have technology which is sophisticated enough to be able to implement the ideas that our philosophers have had for some while. We've never been able to do that before. The opportunity that it offers us is essentially that the models that we build in our code could become utterly reusable. We should be able to look at the point where, instead of designing our models for each application, we just import them like we do any library. And what that means is that our data and our information becomes shareable and reusable between applications without any transformation, without any mapping, without any horrible extraction. We just need to choose to do it. But to explain why that might be the case, I need to take us on a bit of a history tour, I'm afraid. And that's the 2,000 years. And I'm going to start with this fella. Uh, and this is Aristotle. He lived just over 2,000 years ago in Greece. And he, I would argue, has had more influence on the way everybody in this room thinks than possibly any other person that has lived, with maybe the exception of your parents. <laughs> if you have ever modeled something in the real world as a thing that has attributes, then there is a direct line of influence from your code to this fella. What Aristotle gave us was something we now call the substance paradigm. He viewed the world and things in it as having substance and attributes. And what he meant by that was, if I were to pick up a rock, I could describe that rock using attributes such as its color, its hardness, its shape, in terms of its width, length, and all sorts of ways in which I could assign attributes to that rock. But if I could somehow strip it of all of those attributes, I would be left with the very nature of the thing in the first place. It's a rock. That's its nature. That's its essence. And as far as Aristotle was concerned, that's its substance. So let's have a look at what a model might look like in the substance paradigm. We're going to build a simple pictorial model here very convenient for the purposes of doing a demonstration and a presentation, not so great for trying to query it afterwards, but it will serve our purposes today. So let's pick a few objects that exist in the real world. That's my little toy car that I drive around when the weather is nice, or my midlife crisis, as my wife refers to it. That's a slightly bigger car for taking students back to university at the beginning of their term and fetching a somewhat larger amount of kit back at the end of term. And that's me. So, three things that exist in the real world. Well, let's start to build a model of how we might represent those in the substance paradigm. So, first off, we need to put something into the model. Now, if it exists in the model, I'm going to call it a symbol. The symbol I'm going to use here, very simple square box with a description in it. The line simply telling you, well, what's the thing in the real world that we're trying to represent here? So let's put some symbols in for, for all three of those items. Well, now what we can start to do is to think about, well, what sort of attributes do those things have? Well, my little toy car, it's silver, it's got a registration number. It's obviously not that one, but it's got a registration number that looks a bit like that. 
Um, the other car is a slightly different colour, a slightly different registration plate, but it can still be described using the same set of attributes. Uh, as for me, well, I'm a bit of a different thing, so I have a different set of attributes, but I've got a name, I've got a date of birth, I think I've just put the year there. So that's actually, I'm giving away my age there, I realise, but <clears throat> years. Um, so that's, my, that's the attributes, but what, what is this notion of substance? Well, that thing on the left is a Mazda MX-5. The other one, well, that's a Ford Mondeo, and I'm a person. So there's, there's our substance. But Aristotle realized that things aren't quite as simple as that, and that substance itself lives within a hierarchy, which we might represent here as saying both of those things on the left could be described as cars. So the whole notion of substance lives within a hierarchy, um, an inherited hierarchy, and then we attach some attributes at the bottom. Well, that's the substance paradigm. But let's just think about if you were to try to implement a system using that paradigm in the days where you were restricted to pencil and paper, how would you actually do that? That pictorial model is not very good. It's very difficult to look things up in there. Well, you've got a two-dimensional surface, so you'd start to think, well, I know what we'll do. We'll divide it up into rows and columns. For each row, that's a different entry into the model. So maybe the MX, or if I wanted a page of MX5s, so I've got one row for every MX5 I'm talking about, and I'll use columns for the attributes. Um, and in fact, in making that decision, I've just decided that the sheet of paper itself is representing the substance. So maybe I've got a sheet of paper for MX5s, another sheet of paper for Ford Mondeos, and for a completely different system, a sheet of paper for people. But it gets really difficult to think about well, what about if I want to look at cars in total? Well, I could put both sheets of paper into one file and label it cars, but that only really works for that two levels of hierarchy, and if I've got more than that, it really starts to get very difficult. Well, eventually, some bright spark says, I know what we can do. We could say, let's have one sheet of paper for cars. But we still need to know which ones are which type. But that's OK. We can put an extra column on the end, and we can say which type of car it is. So we get one sheet of paper for cars. They've all got the same. They, we, know, we know we need to know their color and their registration number. Stick another column on the end, and that will tell us whether it's an MX-5 or a Ford Mondeo or, or whatever else it might be. So we've flattened that hierarchy. We've taken Aristotle's idea, over 2,000 years old, and we've had to simplify it in order to fit it onto paper. Let's have a look at what we've done to that model. I'm just going to deal with the left-hand side. So here's what it looked like a moment ago when we were trying to model a couple of cars. So that's still as it is within the substance paradigm. But we've done this to it. So we've said straight away, we've taken that middle layer of substance out because we couldn't cope. And we've stuck it down here. So we've actually taken what we previously considered to be the thing's substance, and we've changed it into an attribute. Well, that's fine. It makes our system work. But it was a fairly arbitrary decision. And you can bet your life, if somebody else was trying to tackle the same data for a slightly different purpose, they might well have made a slightly different decision. Repeat that n times, and now we have models that are very, very difficult to relate to one another because they're utterly incompatible. There are a couple of other problems. Many of these were known even when Aristotle came up with this idea. We can see a few hints of them in that simple model. Look at the way I modelled myself, my year of birth. Well, surely year is a thing in its own right. Somebody else somewhere is going to want a model that includes years as actual entries. And that's one of the problems with the substance paradigm. It doesn't handle relationships between things terribly well. There's an even more fundamental issue, which is what is this substance anyway? Is it a thing that exists in the real world, or does it only exist in the model? 
And what are the implications of either of those answers? And if you don't think that's important, well, actually, that's the whole debate about what transubstantiation is, transubstantiation, changing the substance of an object. And that, ladies and gentlemen, has led to some almighty arguments over the years. In the 17th and 18th century, one or two people really started to get to grips with the fact that they didn't like this idea of substance at all. Um, philosophers like John Locke, David Hume, but most notably this fellow, and this is René Descartes. And he started to point us towards a slightly different way of thinking. Now what he said is that if we want to put an item into a model, then it should have extension in space. Now what he meant by that is it should occupy a region of space. It should have length, breadth, and width. Have I missed one there? You know what I mean. It should be a three-dimensional object in space. And if we can't point to a three-dimensional object in space that our symbol is representing, then we've got a real problem and we should ignore it. Now, unfortunately, he didn't take that idea far enough to be able to give us a working system, but he'd done enough to plant the seeds of an idea in a couple of other people's heads. Now, it took some developments in mathematics to come along before we could do much about that, notably set theory. So people like George Boole, John Venn, Gail Cantor. Um, and then one or two philosophers looked at those developments. They looked at Descartes' idea. They looked at the ideas of set theory and thought, you know what, we might be able to stitch these together. Uh, there was an American, Charles Sanders Peirce, but most notably the German, Gottlob Frege. Now, what he said was that the meaning of a symbol that goes into a model is its reference, which is Descartes' notion of it must refer to a thing that occupies space, but also its sense, which probably occupies three or four terms of a philosophy course, but what roughly means is its relationship to other things. So Frege's saying, the things in our model derive their meaning from their reference to an object in space and their relationship with other things. And we call the result of that analysis the logical paradigm. So let's take the right-hand side of the model that we did earlier and let's rework that and let's have a look at what a model might look like in the logical paradigm. So I'm going to model myself again. So first of all, we need to stick a symbol into the model once again. Uh, this time, the line actually has some meaning. This is Descartes' idea of strong reference. In order for that symbol to be there, we have to be able to point to something and say, that's the object in space that it represents. But how do we represent the fact that I'm a person if we're going to do away with the notion of substance? Well, this is where the set theory comes in. What we do is we create a set, actually commonly called a class, so we create a class of things called persons. And now all we need to do is to indicate that the symbol for me is a member of that class. So we need a symbol for that. It's a, a tuple of other objects. I'm going to use a really simple symbol, a little red circle, and I'm going to use some lines to indicate which are the members of that tuple. So that tuple indicates the fact that one symbol is a member of a class. How do we know that that tuple indicates membership? Well, at the moment, we don't. To solve that, we need another class. So we need to define another class that says membership tuples. And we need to make that first tuple a member of this class. Marvelous. Now, the keen-eyed amongst you will notice I've possibly hit a problem here. How do I know what that second tuple means? Now, you're going to have to take my word for it because I haven't got time in hmm, the few minutes I've got remaining. But um, if you've read your Girdle, Escher and Bach, you'll know that this isn't actually a problem at all. This is an inevitability. And actually, we're just very fortunate that we've hit it early on. We're just going to have to deal with it. If that means nothing to you, then I thoroughly recommend you read the Girdle, Escher and Bach book by, let's get this right, Douglas Hofstadter. Uh, for the meantime, I'm afraid you will just have to take my word for it. This isn't a problem, it's just something we need to deal with. But 
the first thing that comes to, that you note when you see that model is it's already a lot more complex than the original a few moments ago. It's got a lot more entries in it. That was five nodes just to represent the fact that I exist and that I'm a person. We didn't even bother with my name. So I thought it might be interesting to do that. Let's just give me my name. Well, my name's not that straightforward. I'm Owen Peter Campbell. Those are all individual names, but I'm sometimes known by all, any of them individually, but I can be known as Owen Campbell. Uh, sometimes my full name is, is, is used. So they've got some relationships with one another that put them into parts and assemble them as a whole. Um, it's not a straightforward notion. And the model looks like that. If there's anybody here from Orient DB, thank you, thank you, thank you. That diagram was so easy to draw. <laughs> That's got 60 nodes in it, just to represent the fact that I exist and that I have a name. Again, the eagle idol amongst you will notice, actually, I'm only using 58 of them. There are two lurking in the corner that seem not to have any relevance whatsoever. We'll come back to the reason for those in a moment. But just bear in mind that we've never been able to implement Aristotle's model before now. This has been around since the 18th century. We certainly haven't had any chance of implementing this sort of thing up until recently. I've been working on this problem for about 20 years now. I first started my career in the petrochemical industry, working on places that looked a bit like this. Now, as a that's a complex piece of equipment, many parts assembled together, sub-assemblies, sub-assemblies that are assembled into assemblies. They get changed like the wind uh, as parts break down and need maintenance. Uh, and the problem that we hit was that many different systems have a view of what that plant consists of. Accounting systems, maintenance systems, control systems, the original drawings from which it was built. And the one thing you can guarantee is those systems cannot agree as to what is the nature of this plant. Um, now, when you get mistakes like that, sometimes they hurt people and they nearly always cost a great deal of money. So this was a problem we were interested in solving. And so we attempted to build a model in the logical paradigm to see if we could do so and if it was of any use. 20 years ago, we came up with two answers. Firstly, yes, it was perfectly possible to do so, uh, but it was unusable. We could represent a plant using the logical paradigm. We had absolutely no chance of ever running a query against it and getting an answer back in a time we were prepared to put up with. Um, the other thing that we found was that we still couldn't cope with things changing over time very easily um, because this is a weakness of the logical paradigm. It still hadn't actually solved that problem. But two things have happened in the intervening 20 years. Firstly, our technology is not what it was when I was playing with this problem 20 years ago. It's an awful lot faster. I've probably got more, more processing power in my pocket than I had to play on this problem uh, 20 years back. And, and we've got graph databases, which I'm sure are going to do something very interesting with this stuff. The other thing that happened is that I actually did some reading and educated myself. The logical paradigm was not the be-all and end-all, as it turned out. Um, and for that, I owe a, a huge acknowledgement to this fella, um, Dr. Chris Partridge, who wrote a book. If, if anything I'm saying here is of any interest to you, I thoroughly recommend you go and find yourself a copy of this fella's book. It's sadly not in print anymore, but um, it's lying around on various people's bookshelves, and you, you can still get copies. Um, and what I learned from that was that in the early 20th century, uh, a fellow called uh, Villard Van Orman Quine, who you may have heard of, uh, his, his name is used for programs that can reproduce their own source code when run, um, but he, he had another idea as well. He realized that Einstein's idea of space-time, the notion that space, three-dimensional space, and time are not two different things, but are in fact two facets of the one thing, space-time, he realized that that insight could be applied to the logical paradigm to say, no, 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 it's not extension in space that matters, it's extension in space-time. 
And that's what those two nodes were on my diagram that I haven't used because I wasn't dealing with the fact that my name might have changed. If I had been, I'd have had to use a couple of those extra nodes that came about as a result of Quine's insight. And I'm afraid I really don't have time to go into how change is modelled over time. Um, we have the notion of something called temporal state, and it has the same sort of relationship with the thing that's changing as the parts of a chemical plant do with their sub-assemblies and assemblies. Um, and I'm going to have to leave it at that because it does get quite hairy quite quickly. I want to finish off by saying, as a result of the fact that I think this opportunity exists, I've done what any of us in this room would have done. I've hacked some code together in 30 seconds flat before this conference, and I've chucked it up on GitHub. Um, I even had time to draw a nice little picky in Inkscape and get it on there as well. So I think the project's got a logo now. Um, if you're interested, we're chucking a website together. It's got virtually nothing on it at the moment. Depending on the, how this talk goes, I'm going to try and explain what a four-dimensional model is on that website. Uh, and there's a few projects on the, at, Git, at GitHub. I'm trying to show how a, a four-dimensional model could be done in a neutral format so that it can be downloaded and imported. I've written a pathetic little Python tool to do that and import it into Orient DB so that I can draw a nice little picture. Uh, and I'm working on trying to do that with a relational database at the moment. Um, I'd be delighted to hear what anybody has to say. Um, please come and grab me afterwards. I'll be around for the sprints tomorrow. Um, in the meantime, if you have any questions, I'd be delighted to take them. Thank you very much, Owen. Can anyone with questions come and form an orderly queue just here? Um, so you're talking about modeling the world. How do you cope with differences of opinion? <laughs> differences of opinion over what is the truth, right. Um, part of the reason of trying to do this is the notion that there is actually only one version of the truth. We may just wish to take different views of it. Of it. Um, so, one view of the fact that I am a person. Well, the fact that, the fact that I am a person, well, is that a fact? Possibly not. A medical doctor might just say, well, no, you're not. You're just a collection of cells, and I'm not interested in the person. I'm interested in how those cells are assembled and what's going on in the component elements of your body. Well, that's fine. That doctor's model might well have my sign as a member of different classes, and he's simply not interested in the fact that I've got myself represented as a member of the person's class. I'm not interested in the classes that the doctor has made my sign a member of. So we can have different points of view simply in the way that we attach signs into classes. Uh, as long as the thing we're classifying has extension in space-time. Does that help? <laughs> so um, it doesn't handle space really well, but there's already uh, something that handles time, which is uh, CRDTs. Uh, which is what, sorry? CRDTs. If you don't know what CRDTs are, it's something to handle that's used to, uh, for models to handle changes over time. So, for example, if two clients uh, are on a DB and they want to uh, update the same record, one is doing one change and the other one is doing the other change, and so we replay change one, change two, change three, and we can get uh, make sure that every change gets implemented and be able to retrieve a state at change three, for example. Uh, does omni 40 uh, also go uh, into that direction? And does the existing paradigm of the CRDTs seem interesting to you? Um, what a four-dimensional model would do in that situation is to say that each of those individual states is a thing in its own right, and it should have a sign in its own right within the model. So it's not a case of looking at the different states of one entity. Actually, we've got many different entities that have a relationship between them, uh, and it's the nature of that relationship that indicates the, uh, the change of state over time. So the 
th th what, what you're talking about here within a relational database that we've all done for years is still working back in that simplified version of Aristotle's model because what we've really done there is just add another attribute on to try to represent change over time. And it kind of works, but it's crude, and if two of us have done it differently, we can't talk to one another. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. There's a lot that's uh, stimulating and interesting. Home. We can much. catch up on that afterwards. I'm here tomorrow. Uh, my question, more or less, is this. It's a bit philosophical, and it may be that I'm asking you to repeat yourself, in which case I apologize. But my question really is, sort of in a nutshell, your investigations and investigations of other people are trying to solve a problem. And what is, it, what is the problem or the question? that you're trying to answer? What's, what's the leading question that's driving all this? The opportunity that's here is the ability to be able to have systems that share one data store. So multiple different systems that have a completely different purpose but have a common set of information that they need to use don't need to be transferring data between each other because their models disagree. They can simply use the same data store. And if we have another application owned by another uh, organization, we can share that data very, very easily because we're all using exactly the same model. We've modeled the truth, but we each wish to take different views of it. Thank you. All right, that's all of our time. Can we all thank Owen for his fantastic talk?